Good morning, everyone. You're listening to The Sci Files, an exposure segment featuring Michigan State University student research. We're your co hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. Today, we're here with Mike Morrison. Mike, can you please tell us about yourself? Sure. So I was a user experience designer for about 10 years, and then I got really burned out, and I quit my tech career and went back to uh, grad school to get a PhD in work psychology. What is UX? So UX is user experience design. If you think of graphic design as making things you know, very aesthetically attractive and emotional, and user experience design, the goal of it is to get the user to their goal as quickly as possible without frustrating them. So if you think of a website you've browsed like a bunch of pop-ups everywhere, and you're going to click through a bunch of things and scroll through stuff just to get to what you want, that's a bad user experience. But the ones where you kind of feel like you know already how to use them, you can get right to what you need, that's a really good user experience. So it's more about eliminating frustration and getting people to goals more than it is about like emotion and like art. Thanks for clarifying that. You said that you left the UX experience because you were burnt out and tired, but you came to grad school. And that kind of is contradictory to me since grad school is pretty exhausting. What do you do here in grad school? Sure. Um, So I'm a PhD student in organizational or work psychology, and I study things that make work meaningful and the differences between like realists and dreamers. And I think I had had experiences in my former career where I had really, really meaningful work. You know, people say you study, you know, what you want to see or what you have. And I had had extremely meaningful work experiences. I wanted to understand that feeling better. And I realized I liked helping people and understanding people more than I liked, you know, coding websites all day, which is perfectly fine in its own. So that's why I wanted to come back and study psychology for real. And then I ended up going back a little bit to UX design and bringing it to psychology. So it sounds like then that you took the technical training that you gained from the private industry and now you're taking those skills to apply it now here in an academic setting. That's exactly right. It's sort of like I think when you have a career, you see, you learn to see the world a different way. And I learned to see the world as a user experience designer. And then I came to science and I realized that they needed user experience design more than they needed my psychology that I was researching. And so I kind of shifted back a little bit. I agree. Like if you go to a conference and you see a presentation, it's just a lot of words and a lot of data just thrown at you. But half the time, the room doesn't even really understand what the person is presenting. How have you applied UX to your graduate thesis? So my thesis is just is just normal science. If you read it, it would just be an overwhelmingly technical paper. But I've applied it more to presentations and posters. Um, when you're a user ex- experience designer, you kind of accept that people are lazy. We've evolved to be lazy. We want the maximum possible information for the least possible effort. And I think in science, that's vulgar. That's like, oh, I'm not lazy. No, I'm hardworking. But, you know, in user experience design, we just like, no, it's cool. Everybody's lazy. Everybody's lazy. So let's just design for lazy. And so what I do is try to design my presentations and posters less to show that I did a bunch of work and more for engagement and accepting that people have a limited attention span and get overloaded very quickly. When I do a presentation or a poster in science, I'm really thinking about how to emotionally move people and how to keep them engaged and keep them from getting bored more than I'm thinking of the science of a data or things like that. It's more, um, I focus more on the story um, because I learned that on the internet. On the internet, if you bore someone for a second, what do, they, what do you do when you get bored on a website? You click the back button, right? So for 10 years, I got sort of conditioned to be afraid of boring people. And I think I try to apply that to my scientific presentations. You mentioned that in your thesis, you're looking at what the difference is between realists and dreamers. Can you go into a little bit more depth about what that means? Sure. So there's this process in your brain that helps you sort of zoom out or zoom in. But if you think of like screwing in a light bulb, you've screwed in a bunch of light bulbs. So you can kind of think about like you're bringing light to your daughter's room or, you know, and you're not really thinking about how to screw in the light bulb. And that's most people. But some people are kind of dysfunctional in their zoom. Some people like if you think of like the IRS agent, he's like really zoomed in and like hyper detailed and he's screwing in that light bulb and he's thinking like, oh, I'm like rotating the sphere of glass and the screeching of the metal and I can't do it. And just like, what if it breaks? going to break all over my hand. The shards of glass are going to go into my skin. And he sort of gets freaked out about that. It's it just that low level of detail. And if you, at the other end, if you think about like the, the artist, like the abstract, flowy, emotional artist is screwing in that same light bulb and they're like, is this really hurting the environment? Like, is this just perpetuating capitalism? Do I support capitalism? What does this say about me? It, they're like super zoomed out and neither of them are screwing in the light bulb efficiently, right? So I'm kind of interested in those dysfunctions, people who are too zoomed out or too zoomed in. And that's kind of what I'm hoping to do for my dissertation. And how does that relate to the concept between dreamers and realists? So the the hyper-detailed people, they tend to be very focused on procedure. 
on how things happen, on whether something is feasible or not. Um, whereas dreamers, people who are very zoomed out, tend to think about how desirable something is, right? It's like it, they go for that big dream shot. It doesn't matter how feasible it is, right? Um, so if you think of someone like Elon Musk, who's like, uh, you know, we've got to like hit this giant goal and, and achieve sustainable energy for the entire planet, but he misses deadlines and then misestimates how long things are going to take and things like that. That's very normal for someone who's that zoomed out because when you zoom out, you start missing those procedural details. And at the other end, you have people who... You've heard the phrase, can't see the forest for the trees. You have people who are hyper-realistic. They're very practical. They can plan very, very effectively. They have trouble zooming out and seeing that broader meaning. How do we find that balance? Most people have. I, th- I don't know this for sure, but I, I, this is all theoretical at this point. But I think that um, most people most people probably can zoom out and zoom in. Most people probably have that balance. Um, but that's a good question for people at either end um, because I think it's it's probably a, a comfort level. I think people who are very detail oriented are kind of uncomfortable kind of zooming out. And I think people who like prefer to be head in the clouds are kind of uncomfortable having to think about like the day to day details. And how do you study this? Right now, there is there are people there are studies that look at how you think when you're kind of zoomed out or when you're zoomed in. So I can zoom you out right now by asking you like why you're listening to this radio show, right? And I can zoom you in by saying, how are you listening to this radio show? You're listening, you know, you're, you turn the dial in your car or on your phone or whatever, um, and, you know, you got the headphones on, but how, why you're listening to this radio show is like you wanted knowledge or you're interested in the latest things and because you're kind of curious, a curious person and you're zoomed out, right? So there's a lot of study on, on studies on how you think at those different kind of zoom levels, um, but studying it in terms of people who, are, who gravitate one way or the other um, it's, a, it's a good question. Right now, the way it's done is you give people a list of um, a list of things, and you see if they categorize them as like you know low level. Like if you're screwing a light bu- screwing in a light bulb, are you rotating a sphere of glass or are you like bringing light to the darkness? And those those are your two choices. And if you choose bringing light to the darkness, you're zoomed out. If you choose rotating a sphere of glass, you're zoomed in. Which is, I think, there could that could be improved on. Which is what I want to try to do. And what would you consider yourself zoomed in or zoomed oh, my out? My whole my whole family is debilitatingly zoomed out. They cannot screw in light bulbs without thinking about the environment and their impact and what are they doing and capitalism and yeah. So, and it's it's been a problem my whole life. And my girlfriend, on the other hand, is very very zoomed in, right? And that's the core difference between us. And I think that's what motivates me to study it because like it's we we see the world so differently, but we're still reasonably effective in our own little worlds, you know. Um, and so. And I'm sure that provides some balance to your world as well. Oh, completely. It com- yeah, it's 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 balancing completely. Do you constantly find yourself trying to figure out if someone zoomed in or zoomed out? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the ones in the middle who can do both really confuse me. I'm like, oh, maybe it won't work. My dissertation's going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I've found that like a lot of people will self-identify. And, um, and as someone, you know, a lot of people are like, the zoomed out sounds very good. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm totally a dreamer. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm, you know, I'm a big idea person. Right. But there's a lot of people will be like, oh no, I'm not that. I, I am that, I am that detail guy. Like I, I like to be really realistic. And then I hate those dreamer guys who come in and the big ideas that are completely impractical. Right. I'm just like, dude, think through your stuff, you know? So it's been funny to watch like people very readily self idea, um, self identify. And cause really there are strengths and weaknesses to both end. There really isn't one that's better than the other. And so, um. Because in neither of them are competent on their own fully, <laughs> like so. Um, I think that's the best. That's the way I've seen so far. That makes sense to me. People are always self-identifying and trying to figure out how they organize themselves. And I'm kind of wondering. I've heard about your Better Poster Initiative, where people are learning about how to make a better poster for academia, which I will ask you to explain. But I'm wondering, did you come up with Better Poster because you were trying to actually criticize? academia and think about it further but using your background knowledge of UX? I think um, it was definitely using the background of user experience design that um, that inspired the better poster. Um, I think what happened was I had a, a really bad health scare. Um, I, w- I was continuing along my career as a psychologist. I was going to you know, do my dissertation, get out of here, get a job, um, ignore all the user experience design issues I saw in science um, because there was no self-interest for me to do anything about it. And then I had a, a very bad health scare. And I think if you've been in that position where you've had a health scare, you've known someone who's gone through a very serious health issue, you know that they're sort of living at the mercy of science. And all you want is for science to speed up and save them. And so I wanted to do something for me and for those people to speed up science, the system of science, all of it, every disease, every discovery. I wanted it to happen faster. And I knew that it was very slowed and very inefficient right now because of these old, badly designed systems in science. 
And so I'm one per I'm only one person. I can't fix scientific publishing, which is a nightmare. But I could take a swing at the poster, and the poster was kind of this low hanging fruit, because scientific posters. So there are, if you don't know, every confer every field in science has conferences, and at every conference there's these poster sessions where scientists share findings um, on these giant poster boards. So if you think of just rows and rows of like cubicle walls with these big posters on them. And scientists are very, very brilliant, passionate people, but they're, you know, they're beginners at design. And so they make the mistakes that beginners make, which is they fill up too much space, they center everything, um, they don't boil things down, there's no hierarchy. Um, and so you have basically a room full of, think of like driving down the highway and seeing billboards with like paragraphs all over them. You just have no time to absorb anything. All the posters are just completely overloaded with like walls and walls of text. And so what I did was I came up with a new default because, you know, we're communicating tens of thousands of new findings every year through basically the same default template for scientific posters that every field uses. So I thought if we could improve the efficiency of that default template that everybody uses, even by a little bit, since everybody uses it, it could have these big ripple effects, you know, improving knowledge dissemination across science and speeding up discovery. Um, and so what I did was I created a new default um, that it's it's very, it's very sort of minimalist um it has if you think of like a, a tv with speakers on the side you have a big center area and in that big center area the tv area is the main finding of the study and that's sort of like the 10 second layer you can learn the main finding of the study while you're walking by in five to ten seconds and then if you want more detail you can walk up to the poster and there's a sidebar with like a tight summary of the study and that's sort of like a, a one minute layer you can get like one minute of additional detail and then if you want even more information if you're still interested in that study then you can talk to the presenter who's standing there, and the presenter has a sidebar on their side where it's sort of like a cheat sheet, and they have all their figures and stuff they can show you. And then if you want even more information and you want the paper, you can take a picture of the poster, and it scans a QR code and gets you a copy of the whole scientific paper. So it lets attendees really learn as they're walking by and choose how much detail they want from each poster instead of just being overloaded by every single poster and not getting anything. So that was the idea, and I wanted to get it out to every field in science. I didn't want it just to get to my own field, and usually in science, if you publish a journal article, it only gets to your field because everybody only reads their own journals. Um, so what I did instead was I published a YouTube cartoon, which took a long time to develop, um, and it felt very silly doing it, but I released it, and it went crazy viral across every field in science, as best I can tell. And then people started trying the design, and they started having these really, really good experiences with this poster design. The first person ever to use a uh, better poster, one best poster in the whole show. And I think when that happened, I felt a lot better. I was nervous at first. I was like, whoa, guys, I haven't tried this. And the first person, you know, won best in show, and I felt a lot better. And since then, we've had lots of poster awards. I've tried it myself. Um, and it seems to be working really well so far. And we have some exit survey data already which we're looking to get published now that shows that um, it is overwhelmingly preferred and better for learning um, and discovery, at least you know people perceive it that way, um, than the old design, at least in one field. Um, so it's, just, it's, a, it's sort of an initial pilot study, but it's, it's very, very promising so far. So to clarify for our audiences then, this better poster project that you're working on is not your dissertation. It's like a side project that you're working on, and your dissertation is the work that you're doing on um, people that are zoomed in versus zoomed out. That's exactly correct. Be the better poster thing, I call it my little like war, my poster war, is completely irrelevant to my degree or my career. <laughs> it's just a complete passion project that I do because um, I think it can improve the system and I want to see it improve. Yeah, and you're making a global impact, it sounds like. I've seen it all over Twitter feeds, uh, people praising this better poster format. So congratulations on the success for that. That's really awesome. Thanks very much. It's been I, I didn't think anyone would use it. I thought I would have to be bothering conferences for years, being like, please watch my little cartoon, and then like it blew up in 24 hours. And I think really I'm so happy that people were brave enough to try it because it's very scary in science to try new things. Scientists are always trying new things with their work, but professionally they conform a lot because – they're very afraid. There's a lot of imposter syndrome in science, so people just sort of are afraid to step out a lot of times professionally. And so I think it's been great that people have been brave enough to like to try it. And then once a few people do, it just it emboldens the rest. So I'd like to add some clarification for our audience. Some people might not be familiar with an academic poster scenario. Would you explain a little bit about academic posters and conferences a little, please? Sure, yeah. So um, my friend Jacob Bradburn, who I think you guys had on your show, um, talked about uh he calls academic conferences kind of like coachella for nerds right it's just where like every every year whatever your field is or whatever your little sub discipline like mine is like work psychology you all go to this one big conference you show up to this hotel in mass and you do presentations and you do posters and you like hang out with each other and people that you don't get to see very often 
Um, and then poster sessions are sort of an event within that. And poster sessions were originally like like the lowest rung to, to participate in the scientific process. It's, it's like um, – if you're a if if you're a new researcher, you're like, oh, you can do a poster, you know, like maybe you're not ready for a presentation or a symposium yet, but you can do a poster. Um, and then grad students still do posters too, um, and so they're kind of treated as this like second class citizen um, of, of conferences. And I think because they were sort of originally designed as just a participation kind of idea, um, I don't know that we ever really thought through like what we really wanted out of poster sessions or what they could be or their potential um, or how to do and much less how to design individual posters and things like that. And so I think that's what science is doing now, um, which is really cool to see. I agree with Mike because I don't think the poster scene has really changed much within the past few years. Like it's maybe developed a little bit because some people get really fancy with law technology and they'll have a ton of televisions and people put their poster up on televisions instead of having it printed out. And people also complain about the economic burden that can be on a student or a lab to print a poster. But then you can also see some people having like a tablet over there to show like some nice video or some animation. And then some people will just print out flyers. But there's no actual standard out there for how to present your research in a poster scenario. They may say like, oh, your poster has to be this size by this size so they, they can fit it over there. But that's basically it. That's exactly right. They don't they don't give you really any guidelines because no one really like I guess no one has guidelines um and you just so what ends up happening is like conferences just copy the layouts that other conferences are using and then like they tell you and then you don't know what to do because you're a new grad student and you're afraid of looking dumb or whatever and so you just copy what somebody else d had done and then you just and then you just copy yourself and so like it really that that's why every field in science uses the same design because everybody just sort of mimics what everybody else is doing um and so it just there was never like no one ever said this is I think people had this concern that it was a bad design that like everybody had sort of a bad feeling about it like it could be better than this. this is really overwhelming but we just kept doing it and I've had people email me and say like Mike you know I was at poster sessions in the 70s and they look the same you know it hasn't changed and even like the negative experience of them hasn't changed I'm really not surprised that people told you that like I I was just guessing some years but I'm I'm really not surprised but um, I'm wondering, do you think that better poster can get better? Like, how can we improve it? Because do you think that it, some people might say, like, oh, is it a waste of space to use that much space just to put a title? Oh, absolutely. Um, I really uh, only intended better poster to be sort of a version one default to build from, right? You've heard the old saying that um, perfection, perfection is not when you have nothing to add. It's when you have nothing to take away. So there's lots of new things we could add to better poster and different ways to do it. And, the, and really underlying better poster are these user experience design principles. And if you knew those, you could do all kinds of new layouts and things. Um, so I really think it's, it's just the beginning. It's just what I wanted, what I wanted it to be was like, if you're not sure what to do, just go better poster, like instead of just doing the wall of text, right? But if you have ideas for something crazier to try, just go, go with it, play jazz, modify it, do something completely new. And I think that's one of the things that people don't realize who presented these poster sessions is that I talk to conference chairs like every week now, and they all want to see more creativity in poster sessions. They all want to let you do whatever you want. They want to see you innovate. They don't want to see you keep copying and things like that. And so, yeah, I really encourage people to just go nuts with posters. Try your craziest idea. Um, but be really uh, respectful that people have a very limited attention span. And the hardest thing about doing like um, more effective designs is teaching yourself to cut really brutally, which is the opposite of how you're trained as, sci as a scientist. Um, and so in, in regards to the, uh, the blank space thing, I mean, negative space is very functional in design. Um, if you look at beginner designers, what they do is they think every, every blank space is something they need to fill up. And if you look at very advanced designers, like like just the legendary designers, their designs are almost entirely blank space because it's negative space because that sort of it, it helps focus the eye on different things. Um, and so I'm not saying that we couldn't reduce the amount of negative space. There's probably room for graphs and images and things like that and better poster. And I was hoping to see that. Um, but I would rather see people leave it blank and keep the po and keep the poster focused um, then clutter it. But if you do have an idea to add, add a sensible graph or add some imagery behind it, that can really enhance it on top of what it already, already is. It's one thing to change the format of the poster itself, but what advice can you give to students about actually presenting the material? Because sometimes the students also have this generic way of just talking about their research, but how can they take a better poster format from the graphical design and bring that into their speaking. I think the best thing you can do is 
protect part of your natural personality for for this part of your professional life. So I think, you know, all the things you do in science or as a student, you do for a grade. You do to please some teacher or please your professor or like make a reviewer happy. And so you're just trying to show that you did a good job or you're trying to talk like you did a good job and be professional. When you when you talk to people or when you present science, when you go to communicate it, drop that completely. You, you want to communicate science as casually as you talk to a friend or family member who has no idea what you're doing. And, and that confidently and with that sense of like safety that it doesn't really matter how you say it, you're just kind of having fun with it. And that's really opposite of how you're conditioned in science. You're conditioned to like cover every base and don't, never say anything wrong. But if you embrace that like fun side of yourself, like you'll do such a better job communicating. You'll probably say it faster. You'll probably say it in a more memorable way. Um, and just sort of you just have to switch modes and just be free of that sense of like judgment and like give yourself that like psychological safety to say it however. And I think for teaching science communication, I think that has implications too. I think when we teach science communication, we have to give students an opportunity to like just free wheel and in like a judgment free kind of zone and develop a sense of feedback, not when like they're getting a bad grade or a good grade or doing enough work or not doing enough work, but when they're losing or getting or gaining the audience's attention. And that's, that's, hard. it's easier said than done, but that's what you need to be a good communicator. You have to develop that sort of spidey sense about like when people are lost or when they're engaged, um, which is the opposite of just turning in a big mess of text for a grade. I agree. I would say it's safe to say that Chelsea and I also feel the same way about everything you just said. It's the main reason why we founded this radio show. So that way we can give other graduate students the opportunity to show off their personality while talking about their research in a way that doesn't have to feel so formal. So thank you for always, you know, also heading that route as well when it comes to the poster. Oh, no, that's great. And that you guys are doing that. I think when grad students come on this, it gives them that real practice, right? Like, um, and I think we, we, I would like to see so much more of that, you know, and I think if, if every scientist had to know that they were going on the radio to talk about their research, we would, we would train ourselves completely differently, you know. I agree with everything that you're both saying because I think it's very important for people to actually put their personality into their research. You can have awesome data, but if you don't have any personality or any emotions into it, no one's going to really be engaged with when you're speaking. For example, like a month before you actually came out with the Better Poster YouTube video, I went to my professor or my boss and I told her, I was like, I want to make a graphical abstract. She's like, okay, cool, go for it. And I was like, okay, I want to make my poster look different. And so I study the bladder and I tried out this design where I put a gigantic bladder on the, on the poster. And I was like, okay, this gets people attention, but it's not doing anything. So I actually make a graphical abstract and I put it smack in the middle and I put the title, but I didn't do the block with the color like how you did. And because I did that and I was able to effectively communicate my research, I won Best Poster. And it wasn't because of my specific data. It was also because people were able to understand what I was talking about. And I think it's so important for people to actually keep pushing forward. But some people might just be like, like you're saying, like they're like, okay, they're lazy about it. They're just going to be like, okay, Better Poster 1.0. They're not going to go any further than that. People aren't going to be like, oh, let me put a fancy border or something like that. Because I've heard a lot of people say like, oh, I just got this template off of my lab. And they just copy it and just keep going there and there. And I'm curious now, how do you think that posters will keep evolving now? So I think that if, if I have any say in the matter, um, I'd really like to see them keep going in the direction of very, very fast learning. So if you think of a, a, a paper, you know, it takes you an hour to read a paper on one topic. That's how you, if you have an hour to read, to look at one thing, you do a paper. If you have an hour to do three things, you go to a, a symposium and you see three presentations in an hour, 15 minutes each, right? Or whatever, plus pad time. And then if you think of where poster sessions would fit into, the, into that, right now, it takes you five, 10 minutes to go through a poster if it's a wall of text, right? So you're getting like, again, three or four, that's, that's optimistic in an hour, Right. I think that's a missed opportunity. We could make posters so fast. What if we could make them fast enough to get 50 posters in an hour, to be able to walk through a room and feel like your brain's just getting this giant software update and be as engaged as you are in like an art show where you're just like fascinated and like recharged. And some people do an okay job. Some people do amazing jobs that like recharge you and get you interested again. And you can't wait to see the next poster. Um, and you end up attending multiple poster sessions because they're so creative and so easy and accessible. I think that's where I'd like to see it go. I mean, if it goes there, if poster sessions become the fastest way to learn what's going on in your field, you go to every one. You, you, it would be it would become a main draw instead of a second class citizen, and it would teach um, it would teach scientists actual science communication skills. Because right now, splattering your paper all over a poster does not teach you how to communicate science. Sitting with it and trying to just brutally, painfully boil your 
perfect study down into a minute of like content that's engaging, that's painful, but you will learn so much about science communication from it. And so it'll, it'll train us to be better science communicators. It'll give that creative side that wants to put giant bladders on posters, which I think is an amazing idea. Um, it'll give that an outlet and, and reward it in a way that it should be rewarded. So I think if that helps, I think that's where it's going to me. It's a cross between exploring an art show and getting like a really fast software update on everything that's going on in your field. That's where I'd like to see it go. I don't know if, I, if we can get it there, but I'm going to try. I think you're making really great efforts. Yeah, and I agree. I think it's really great work that you're doing, and we really need to continuously push to not let our standards stagnate, but we should always try to push forward and make something new and better. So thank you, Mike, for joining us today for this interview, and good luck with the rest of your dissertation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you to all of our listeners that joined us this week. And remember, the truth is in the science. Any comments and questions can be directed to scifiles at impact89fm.org. We'll see you all next week on Scifiles.